Funding for Bombs Away was provided by Mrs. Victoria B. and Mr. Paul H. Saunders by Peter D. Kiernan. Additional support was provided by the following. This particular phone only rings in a serious crisis. Keep it in the hands of a man who's proven himself responsible. Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. Only rarely do you have an election that redefines one or both parties and sets the tone for decades to come. That's 1964. Daddy, he knew that there were things that needed to be done in this country. As he said, now I have the opportunity and I'm going to make the most of it. Barry Goldwater was a jut-jawed, handsome Arizona senator and a conservative who spoke with clarity and decisiveness. A deeply principled man who would stand up to the Eastern liberal establishment and especially who would take a tough line in the Cold War. But a he's an aggressor and eventually you'll have to go to war with him. The thing about Goldwater's rhetoric that scared people was that Goldwater would kick off a nuclear war. He didn't want Goldwater's finger next to that button. We have the guts to make our intentions clear. So clear they don't need translation or interpretation. Senator Goldwater was not the, quote, extremist, unquote, that he was painted. Some of the people behind him were, but he wasn't. In 1964, it was the grassroots in the Republican Party that changed the GOP forever. Almost the entire Republican establishment, either publicly or privately, abhorred Goldwater, didn't want him to be the nominee, and then really didn't support him when he became the nominee. It awoke a sleeping giant. People who were tired of government telling them what to do and living their lives, and all of a sudden Goldwater brought them out. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. Johnson was a person who felt the government had to be active in people's lives in order for you to get what you needed. Private industry, private sector wasn't going to do all of it, couldn't do all of it. If you look at the raft of laws that he passed in the subsequent year or two, it's enormous. It's most of the fabric now of our social policy. When Johnson went with the Civil Rights Act, remember, winning in the biggest landslide in the history of the country, he lost five southern states. Certainly all the polarization we're talking about now has a lot to do with that realignment of the country with the South becoming Republican. That 64 election really changed the country. It was a momentous election in a lot of ways. It transformed the way that politicians talked to their electorate through their advertising. Now children should have lots of vitamin A and calcium but they shouldn't have any strontium-90 or cesium-137. The Daisy commercial was uh, born. They kicked up the notch of dirty politics. We must either love each other or we must die. That's become a classic of how to define your opponent. Johnson had said, Goldord is already tying the rope around his neck. So let him keep doing it with all of his statements and what he's saying out there on the field. And all we have to do is give it a little tug. Mm -hmm. So the little tug were the ads that these characters concocted. You look back at all the election maps and you see what really caused a realignment. What caused people to think differently about their partisan identification? And boy, it was 1964. The ads before 1964 weren't just primitive, they were dull. Eisenhower answers America. The Democrats have made mistakes, but aren't their intentions good? Well, if the driver of your school bus runs into a truck, hits a lamppost, drives into a ditch, you don't say his intentions are good, you get a new bus driver. What is the most important issue confronting the American people in this election campaign. The 1960s presents our country with great opportunities and great challenges. Well, they were dreadful. I think there was no room for an emotional appeal in a political ad that they had to be fact-based, rational presentations. 
Probably the most exciting ones involved a jingle because it was the jingle air on television. Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president, Ike for president. You like Ike, I like Ike, everybody likes Ike for president. Hang out the banner, beat the drum, we'll take Ike to Washington. Virtually every product was sold with a jingle, so I like Ike with prancing elephants became the symbol for Eisenhower in 1956. John F. Kennedy had the Kennedy, 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 Kennedy ad that would literally drive you insane if you listened to it too many times. Well, in 1964, we began the era of professional television advertising that really did have an impact. Gordon Burnback was an up and coming advertising firm on Madison Avenue it was making a name for themselves with advertisements for up-and-coming firms and products that included Volkswagen. John F. Kennedy saw the spots and told his brother-in-law, Steve Smith, go find me that firm. I want to talk to them about maybe doing my advertising for my re-election in 1964. And that's how DDB came into the orbit of Lyndon Johnson and the DNC in 1964. Johnson and the people around him his aides and his advertising firm wanted to portray Goldwater as a dangerous man who, if he got control of the nuclear arsenal, might threaten the peace of the world. What we need to get it on is his impetuousness and his impulsiveness and his own turn to bomb on somebody else. Yeah, of course, even more than that, in my judgment, is the economics. I don't know, mother's pretty worried she thinks her child drinking contaminated milk or that maybe she's going to have a baby with two heads or things like that. He's pretty vulnerable and I, I think we'll take care of himself some. I think we get on to deciding now what the house is going to be run over the day in the next few months and what your television spots are going to be. The mood of the country at the time was one of worry about the Soviet Union in particular. Peace was a big issue. Bombs away. That fear of nuclear holocaust had been part of all of us who grew up in the 50s and 60s. And by that time, we were used to it after hiding under our desks for so many years. <laughs> Saturday Evening Post article dated August 31st, 1963, Barry Goldwater said, Sometimes I think this country would be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and let it float out to sea. Can a man who makes statements like this be expected to serve all the people justly and fairly? Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. We had a, uh, I, I guess I would call it a rift between the so-called Rockefeller Republicans and uh, the conservative Republicans, Rockefeller representing the liberal wing of the Republican Party, which uh, by and large supported the Great Society programs and by and large supported the civil rights legislation. Well, the rift between uh, Goldwater and Rockefeller, it goes back basically to the battle between uh, Taft and Dewey and between Taft and Eisenhower, the conservative wing of the Republican Party, against the Eastern liberal establishment, the moneyed class, Wall Street. The Rockefellers, George Romney, Scranton, they were kind of the titular heads of the party on the East Coast, and the East Coast pretty well ran the party. It wasn't East and West, it was East and Midwest. It was the Heartland Republicans. By the time the Eisenhower administration came over by the 50s, the Midwestern heartland Republicans were looking to take the party back. Ever since the last Republican convention, thousands of Americans have asked me to seek the Republican presidential nomination in 1964. Today, here at our home, in the state that I love, 
with my family and with the people whose friendship and political interest have placed me where I am, I want to tell you that I will seek the Republican presidential nomination. There were a lot of people that wanted him to run, and there was really nobody else that he could pass that off to. And the reason he ran is was because he didn't want to let these people down, knowing he probably wasn't going to win. It was Goldwater who first said and knew he was not going to win the election because he said the country will not take three presidents in over a period of two years. It was too much of a, a shock. I'm not going in this thing with any dream. I think it's going to be a very difficult thing for a Westerner from a small state, population-wise, uh, to get the nomination. But I think it's time that uh, we give the Republicans a choice uh, other than the Eastern Seaboard or the Western Seaboard. And I'm willing to take that chance. Don't look now, young man, but somebody has his hand in your pocket. It's the hand of big government. It's taking away about four months' pay from what your daddy earns every year, one dollar out of every three in his paycheck. And it's taking the security out of your grandmother's social security. You know, that's the great trouble with big inflationary government. It takes more and more of your earnings. It slowly but surely destroys individual initiative and responsibility. Government must draw its strength from the people. And as it drains away this strength, it must inevitably undermine the foundations of self-government. I ask you to join me in helping restore the individual freedoms and initiatives this nation once knew. To make government more the servant and not the master of us all. In this free nation, we do not choose to be ruled. We elect to be governed. In your heart, you know he's right. Vote for Barry Goldwater. The big campaign uh, was, was California. We had to take California. By that time, Rockefeller was in the race. It was in that campaign that Rockefeller used all the nasty stuff that was later used. The Rockefeller's campaign ran TV ad says, Senator Goldwater cannot start a world war. President Goldwater could. Rockefeller ruined his chances with a very messy divorce and a remarriage to Happy Murphy. They had also clearly been having an affair. Happy had Rockefeller's son just days before the California primary. And this was in an age when publicly known adultery was not tolerated in politicians. Senator Barry Goldwater needs a thousand hands to receive congratulations after his victory in the California presidential primary. And I've never been so excited as when Barry Goldwater won the California primary. I can't recall any election, including the election of Richard Nixon, of which I was more excited at that particular time because I knew that meant he had the nomination. However, Governor Rockefeller has promised a fight to the finish. Now, most of the sound and fury will fade until the Republicans convene in San Francisco's Cow Palace. Did I think he could beat Lyndon Johnson at that point? Basically, no. When they got to the convention at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, the moderate liberal Republicans, Scranton, Rockefeller, Romney, were not reconciled to Goldwater's nomination. You had that Eastern establishment out there all jockeying for enough delegates. The Goldwater contingent outmaneuvered everybody. We were so well organized. Everyone had walkie-talkies, and there were communications with a headquarters in a trailer outside the Cow Palace. They had every delegate identified and pinpointed, knew where he was, what his vote was going to be. They had uh, people walking through the Cow Palace, making sure that nobody was out of line. It was well orchestrated and very well done, and uh, we smothered them and uh, took over. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Thank you. 
And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. And when he said that, and people were stunned uh, by the thing, one of the reporters turned around and said, my God, he's going to run his Goldwater. Barry Goldwater got up and tore that convention apart again by that line that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And I remember I was at Stone Harbor watching it with my father, and he wanted to see what kind of candidate Goldwater was. He got up and said he's finished. And he was. He was way to the right of where the country was. Well, people didn't want to hear about extremism from him or from any presidential candidate. Nelson Rockefeller, after the uh, convention had nominated Barry Goldwater, got it up to give a speech. And usually you would expect them, a warm embrace of the candidate that did not prevail and to unify uh, going to the election. It is essential that this convention repudiate here and now any doctrine. And he would get up to the microphone to talk and the booths would shake the rafters. Any doctrinaire, militant minority, whether communist, Ku Klux Klan, or Bircher. And he'd have to step back from the microphone and they'd subside and then get up and he'd start to open his mouth and they'd start again. And he couldn't talk. It, was, it went on for uh, about over 15 minutes. Wholly alien to the sound and honest Republican liberalism that has kept this party abreast of human need. The forces that could nominate Goldwater from the South and West we're tearing the Republican Party away from the Republican Eastern establishment forever. And they could sense that. You get it, sir. It's your job. Now look, the governor hasn't had a chance to talk. He's been up here 10 minutes and he hasn't had a chance to talk for about four minutes. And I think they believe that when Goldwater goes down, then that fever will pass and we will get our party back and they never got it back. Back in July in San Francisco, the Republicans held a convention. Remember him? He was there, Governor Rockefeller. Before the convention, he said Barry Goldwater's positions can, and I quote, spell disaster for the party and for the country. Or him, Governor Scranton. The day before the convention, he called Goldwaterism a, quote, crazy quilt collection of absurd and dangerous positions. Or this man, Governor Romney. In June, he said Goldwater's nomination would lead to the, quote, suicidal destruction of the Republican Party. So, even if you're a Republican with serious doubts about Barry Goldwater, you're in good company. Lyndon Johnson was a Washington insider, a wheeler dealer, a riverboat gambler, a guy who cuts deals for programs. The antithesis of Barry Goldwater, who would take a clear-cut stand on principle. But no one doubted that he was an extremely effective politician, Johnson, especially as a congressional politician and a leader on the Hill. Understanding that he had gotten the presidency in the worst possible way, he knew that the only way out was to establish himself with a victory so large that no one could say he was simply filling the office in what would have been Jack Kennedy's second term. I think that he wanted a landslide because then he knew he'd get his legislation passed. Roosevelt was his hero. And I think that Johnson said to himself that I'm gonna be as good as Roosevelt, maybe even better. If he came in as a powerhouse and with strength like that, it was going to be tough for the Congress to turn him down on the difficult things he wanted to get past.
We are used to conventions today that are completely scripted and utterly boring. My fellow Americans, I accept your nomination. What I think was significant about the Democratic Convention, it also began the tradition of heavily scripted conventions. They carefully thought about what should happen each evening, what people at home would see. New Jersey was picked in part because at the time it voted Republican quite often, and it was part of that Northeast Republican uh, philosophy. And let none of us stop to rest until we have written into the law of the land all the suggestions that made up the John Fitzgerald Kennedy program, and then let us continue to supplement that program with the kind of laws that he would have us write. And the theme of the convention was, let us continue. And that said about as clearly as possible that Johnson was John F. Kennedy's successor and that his election would permit people to continue the policies they now overwhelmingly back. Most Americans want an education for every child to the limit of his ability, and so do I. Doral Dane Burnback, they had a surprising amount of control. They treated the convention hall as a television studio. Most Americans want victory in our war against poverty, and so do I. They decorated the hall. From the banners to just about everything that happened during the convention bore some of BDB's uh, fingerprints. They treated the convention like an advertising event. So in, in many ways, they staged the convention, which was a new innovation as well, to turn a convention over to an advertising firm. It still took another 20 or 30 years for the parties to really learn that they had to turn this into a four-day television commercial. These are the goals of this great, rich nation. These are the goals toward which I will lead if the American people choose to follow. Issues and Answers. Senator, the news from South Vietnam and indeed from all of Southeast Asia gets worse and worse with each passing day. Now, a lot of the supply lines seem to run in, on the Laotian border, in any yes. case, through jungles and long trails. How could you interdict those? There have been several suggestions made. I don't think that we would use any of them. But uh, defoliation of the forest by low-yield atomic Weapons could well be done. Uh, when you remove the foliage, you remove the cover. On October 24th, 1963, Barry Goldwater said of the nuclear bomb, merely another weapon. Merely another weapon. Johnson's strategy against Goldwater can be summarized in one word, extremism. That was how he wanted to define Goldwater, and Goldwater played a role himself at every turn. I want American kids to grow up as Americans, and they will, if we have the guts to make our intentions clear. So clear they don't need translation or interpretation, just respect for a country prepared as no country in all history ever was. In your heart, you know he's right. Vote for Barry Goldwater. Goldwater's slogan, in your heart, you know he's right. His advisors tried to talk him out of that because they realized the use of the word right re-emphasized his conservative platform. Goldwater insisted upon it. And it took Democrats approximately five minutes to come up with their parody, in your guts, you know he's nuts. So Lyndon Johnson and the Democratic Party painted Goldwater as some guy that would be reckless. And I think that was a big part of it. And so the whose hand do you want on the trigger was a commonplace thing in the campaign.
that set up what Johnson wanted to do, which was portray himself as a peacemaker. But the irony of this, it's sort of like Woodrow Wilson in 1916 campaigning for peace and we go to war a few months later, Lyndon Johnson, the same thing. Atomic weapons are not simply bigger and more powerful than other weapons. From the American Revolution until now, about 526,000 Americans have died in battle. A single atomic bomb can kill more than that in a few minutes. He portrayed himself as a man of the middle and who was going to carry on the program of the Democratic Party. Our great nuclear power must not be placed in the hands of those who might use it impulsively or carelessly. Peace cannot be left to those who will not guard atomic weapons as a special responsibility. Goldwater was, uh, you know, like a giant apple on top of somebody's head. I mean, he, he was the perfect target. And he was so big, it was hard to miss the bullseye. Johnson was a politician, and he clearly understood that there was something to be gained by passing a civil rights bill. But I think that's too simple of an explanation. Johnson, I think, believed in civil rights. What he wanted to do is get it on the books. He wanted to open that door. He wanted to show people how important it was, make them understand that this would make their own life so much better. He grew up in abject poverty with abject poverty all around him, and he was very, very sensitive to that. The two things he was were driving him were in his DNA were discrimination.